Welcome back to Introduction to Agroecology. We're in Unit 8. We're going to this time cover Lesson 3 of Unit 8 on the environmental factors. Um, this one we're going to cover fire. On the environmental effects from fire, that it's a major disturbance. In other words, it disrupts the ecology of the area. <clears throat> Some of the uh, major disturbances are it's going to displace animals. If there's a fire, they're not going to stay in the area. They're going to leave the area. It's also going to remove uh, a lot of the dominant plant species that are there. It's also because it's going to burn up portions of the whatever's in that area. It could be plant residue. It could be trees. It could be uh, crops that you have. It's going to return nutrients, carbon back to the soil. Uh, it removes by burning the litter that is on a forest floor if it happens to have that. But a forest floor could also be a field. It could also be a pasture land. I mean, it's forest floor is just an area for the, the bottom, the base of your soil. Um, different types of uh, fires that you can use in agroecosystems. There's three natural types. Um, they're surface fires, crown fires, and ground or subsoil fires fires. It's basically going from surface down to subsoil, they get more intense and are more destructive from the first down to the third one. What do you need in order to have a fire? Well, if you don't have anything to burn, the organic matter, you aren't going to have fuel for the fire, so it's not going to burn very long. Generally, you need dry weather. If it's just rain, there's probably not a good chance that you're going to get a fire. And then you need to have some way in which that fire starts. Um, looking at surface fires, um, basically all it does is burn the grasses, any leaves that are there, any organic litter. Like if you had a cornfield and you had that residue on top, it would burn that off and that'd be it. It pretty much um, moves across the canopy without harming any trees that are there because it's so fast moving. It's the most common type of fire that we have. And it's one sometimes that are set by humans uh, in order to control weeds or invasive vegetation. Uh, a lot of prairie burns that you hear about <coughs> are done um, in, in order to control some of the non-wanted plants in there. It's the simplest way to get rid of them. And another way of uh, referring to it is a prescribed fire. Here are some forest rangers that are standing here getting paid a lot of money to watch a fire burn. And it's a, one of those surface burns, surface fires, that it's not burning and you can see it's not uh, getting the trees all messed up because it'll go through there real fast. It just burns that, it's right on top. And then if it gets where it gets too intense, they can put it out and that's why the foresters are there. They'll throw dirt on it, they'll throw water on it depending on what situation they have. A crown fire, on the other hand, a crown is above the area above it, the canopy. And that's where an entire forest could be consumed. Um, if it's crops, it could be the entire crop is consumed also. It's generally extremely fast moving. It gets hot very fast. And it does damage to uh, specific plant species. Uh, in some cases, it will rejuvenate other plants. It depends on the type of plant. Some plants do better if they burn a little bit and they're able to regrow and regenerate. Um, when you have a crown fire, there is also a possibility that it's a surface fire too in some, some of the areas. If you have a ground or subsoil fire, it's the most destructive fire. It's generally slow moving, but what happens is, is it burns down through the roots. And when that occurs afterward, it has much more organic matter um, and it's a richer soil. They're not as common, but when it happens because it's more intense and high temperature and burning, that it ends up uh, you have much, much, much better soil as a result. But you also lost everything that was there. There's nothing left. Um, fires can also be a combination of the three types we talked about. They can occur as a prescribed burn. That's when the, someone sets it on purpose. They can be accidentally set by humans, throwing a cigarette butt out. Um, yeah, you get in a car crash and the gas tank explodes and it starts a fire. There's lots of ways, natural gas explosions. Um, sometimes it's natural in ours, and you can have, uh, natural would be something like a lightning strike. 
Um, what are the changes that happened in the composition of the soil after the fire? Well, the biotic and abiotic components will change. The biotic components are those living components. The abiotic are the non-living. Um, what change occurs really depends on what was there to start with. Um, the type of vegetation will determine what type of living and non-living components you might have around, uh, at what stage of the development it is. There are some uh, biotic or living components that will not be around until a certain point in plant growth. They come in and invade the plant at a certain time um, that they want to grab uh, the nutrition from the plant for themselves. The type of soil you have can make a difference. When in the year does it happen? Because at different times of the year, it might be colder, it might be warmer, and different um, biotic components may or may not be around based on those other conditions. And then uh, the other thing is it takes a while once you lose some of the components, the biotic components, that, that even though they um, would be killed during the fire, they will come back from other areas to, to re-inhabit the area, but it'll take some time. So if you have a fire every year, it's possible you might not have some of these components based on that fact. Um, leaves underneath uh, uh, for the abiotic component, they would not be there if you had a surface fire every year or if you did a controlled burn every year to get rid of the leaves. There are not going to be as many there the next year. Um, some of the abiotic <coughs> components, generally, they're uh, short in duration. An extremely hot fire will benefit the most in terms of that agroecology management. That blackened soil surface, um, actually, it doesn't reflect light. Black doesn't. So that you will have increased solar gain. In other words, it will stay in that soil longer. It'll warm the soil up faster because of that. Even in the wintertime, you'll have a warmer soil. Um, after a fire, the soil nutrient holding capacity is decreased. And why is that? Because you have a high level of carbon in the soil and you don't have that those different um, biotic components that will help keep those minerals uh, and nutrients where you want them to be. Um, and that comes back after a fire, though, um, over time. Um, the available moisture is going to increase due to the removal of vegetative cover. Um, and because of that, if you have a bunch of leaves on the ground, not as much is going to go right in the ground. It, more is going to run off because it can't get through the leaves. Uh, continuing on abiotic compo uh, components, um, short-term issues until the vegetation cover is returned. Um, the bulk density will go up of your plants. Um, the soil aggregate size is reduced um, because it was broken apart by the fire. The permeability and infiltration are diminished because you have the char, the carbon that's laying on top. Um, because of that, you could have a potential increase in the runoff of rain instead of seeping into the ground as much. Uh, you could also have more nutrient leaching because if the uh, nitrogen is put on and it isn't able to penetrate the vegetative cover or the char that's there, excuse me, then you could possibly have more uh, nutrient leaching because of that and having the soil erosion because of that char that's there. Um, biotic components will usually recover quicker um, because a lot of them are stimulated by bacteria, in other words, a rise in pH. Um, plants and animals in the direct path of the file certainly are in peril, uh, and if it's too hot, everything's going to be removed. Um, there's nothing going to be left. Um, if parts of the ground burn, um, and we talked about this where it was a ground fire, um, the areas below the ground probably will never come back. In other words, um, you will have some things that were there that you won't see again. On the other hand, when they do things like prairie burns, uh, and, and it can be also in a forest too, there are certain germs that need heat in order to germinate, and then they'll regrow based on that. Um, animals will generally leave an area immediately and they will come back as the growth starts occurring again. They certainly aren't going to come back if it's a blackened area of your uh, forest area. Um, the fate of the soil-dwelling organisms, uh, fungus 
bacteria, spiders, millipedes, and earthworms, they have a pretty fast recovery, but they would have been wiped out um, by most fires. Adaptation to plants because of fires. There have been plants that, because there's so many fires, that they have developed a resistance. Some trees have thicker barks. Um, some foliages of plants have become more fire resistant. Um, some of the conifers would be in that category, the, the evergreens, um, commonly called evergreens. Um, tolerance of fires, and, and it's those seeds that are able to re-sprout after a fire. They like being uh, heated up in order to germinate. <clears throat> some of them, in order to reproduce, they don't reproduce unless there's a fire. So um, that's not real common, um, but that certainly would provide for um, the ability to have long-term survival. Um, and we talked about the seeds that only germinate after a fire, and then some plants actually flower after there's a fire. But those certainly would be more the surface ones, not that um, the ground-type fire. Uh, benefits of uh, fires and agro ecosystems, it will clear the ground. If you have an area that has, a, especially if it's a dry area, where they have these forest fires, you have the leaves that are underneath all of the trees. Um, it would certainly clear that area out if you had a pretty decent fire. Um, when it does that, it adds nutrients into the soil, although it may take a while before it starts being able to be used. Um, it could help in crop residue management, although I've never heard of a farmer um, starting a corn or soybean fire uh, after they harvested to get rid of the crop residue. It's probably not a smart thing. You could start a whole huge area on fire. Um, one area the effects you have is you help control weeds because you're burning the weeds down. Um, you aren't going to have as many weeds. Um, you could also, if you had an infestation, um, it, could, it would certainly manage, uh, if you had an insect issue, it would get rid of the issue you have with that. Pathogen management, if you get the fire hot enough, pathogen is a disease, and it would help you control a disease maybe that was there. You could burn it and, you know, you burn it out, basically. Um, it's a way you can prepare a crop for harvest. <coughs> Sugar cane is an example. And then... It's a way to manage pastures and ranges. That would be more of the weed management where you're getting rid of um, undesirable plant species. Um, for land clearing, um, it is the quickest way to clear land. If you had a tremendous fire that you burned everything down, there's not a cheaper way. If you paid a company to come in and cut out the timber, assuming the wood wasn't any good, it's going to be a lot more expensive than if a forest fire just kills it and knocks everything out. Um, sometimes they'll do this after they've cut down trees to clear cut the logs, um, after they've clear cut the logs. And it's one way. That'd be more probably of a surface fire. By doing this, it's a management tool in which they can highly reduce the chance of a wildfire existing. The more evergreen needles, the more leaves, the more other debris that you have on the ground, if it gets dry, the more chance you have of having a wildfire. So it's trying to reduce that chance is why you would do land clearing every once in a while. Forest preserves in Cook County, um, the Forest Preserve District of Cook County does that on a regular basis in their different forest preserves to try to control an issue if they ever did have it. Um, uh, uncontrolled wild burn, they, which they certainly would never want in an urban area where there's a lot of people living. Um, and then the nutrient additions to the soil, uh, burned ash leaches back into the soil, returning potassium at a rate of about 2.6%. If you're burning ash, um, appreciable amounts of phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, and uh, some of the other trace elements would be put back into the soil. Uh, being water sol soluble, washout can occur. So when that happens, there is possibility of leaching of some of these elements. <clears throat> and no one's really totally sure which crops would benefit the most. There hasn't been enough research to really know that. Um, some of the benefits of uh, 
fires and agroecosystems for crop residue management is parts of the plant um, remain after harvest. So if you burn them up, then the more that are there, the more nitrogen that will become available for plant uptake in the future, and less tillage is going to be needed. And, and less tillage is going to be needed. In underdeveloped countries, um, they use a lot of the um, crop residue to heat homes um, and in a big way. They don't have any money to buy anything else, so that's what the corn stalks they use, that type of thing. Some of the negative impacts on for crop residue with fires is the loss of nutrients from volatilization or leaching. Volatilization where it changes into a different form. Um, leaching is where it leaves the area. You possibly could have air pollution from a fire. Um, you could have uh, more surface exposure. If it burned enough, you might have the dirt exposed, so that's not a good thing. We could have all kinds of issues with runoff, um, dried up from the being dried up from the sun, those types of things. And you could possibly, if it burned hot enough, you could lose some of that organic matter, that top few inches of your soil. Um, using for weed management, if you want to get rid of weeds that are there and they're out of control, it's it gets rid of the, the weed itself plus any seed that's there. So that's helpful. As much as you can burn of that, the better off you are. Um, some of the potential uses for wheat management in here, if we had perennial weeds, and there are annual and perennial weeds that are out there, um, some of them might have uh, fire resistant roots, some of them have rhizomes, some of them have crowns, and a fire is not going to possibly do any damage to um, those perennial weeds depending on what type of roots it has. Um, you can also use it as a way in which you stimulate some plants growth once you do it. And if it's fallow for too long, in other words, if you haven't used the land for a long period of time, you could really lose a lot of nutrients once you've uh, gotten rid of the weeds. Um, some of the benefits for management of insects on fires and agroecosystems includes um, eliminating insects that cause you damage or possibly preventing damage by insects prior to the damage happening. Um, a lot of times the problem with that second point is that it's if you do that, you could lose the crop too. So, how do you how do you get rid of those insects without getting rid of the plant? Sometimes that's a challenge. Um, pathogen management that's the disease management. So, if you manage the insects, if you get rid of some insects that cause diseases, that could help get rid of some of the pathogens that cause diseases. Uh, it also is a means to remove or reduce fungi, bacteria, and nematodes. Uh, so if you, you can burn them out, if you have uh, ones you don't want, you, it's a way to get rid of and start over. Um, fire has been shown to reduce the inoculum of disease on various crops, including some of your ornamentals, some of your small grains, like soybeans and hay, alfalfa, on cotton, on potatoes, and on grasses. And um, basically, the inoculum is the poison of the disease. So in other words, it, the amount of its ability to, to spread that disease has been reduced by fires in those types of plants. Um, preparing a crop for harvest. Sugar cane harvesting, and I mentioned this couple about by eight slides back, that harvesting of sugar cane, there's cocoa leaves, and you by burning them off, it makes it easier to harvest the with the, the big uh, buoy knives, and that they can cut the sugar cane off of, so they don't have to cut the cocoa leaves to get to the sugar cane, they can just cut off the sugar cane. Uh, another benefit of um, for preparing a crop for harvest, uh, and benefiting with using a fire is that it removes rats and snakes from the field. I guess I wouldn't want to be around when they do that if you were on the side of a field, but okay, I'll believe it. Um, removing pitch from pine cones by heating up and adding rocks to the pine cones 
and when you heat them up, they crack, allowing for easy removal of the pine knots. And the pitch is the um, coating on the pine knot. In other words, you got to get rid of that heat, the pine knots inside of a casing. Uh, pasture and range management. Um, you can use a prescribed burn, and that's one you decide to do yourself to promote nutrient recycling. Uh, you can use get rid of a prior year's growth to reduce a fire hazard. If it's a dry year and stuff isn't growing real well, and you had the old corn stalk, you know, laying in the field, you might not want to um, leave it there because it could be a fire hazard. Um, in terms of using the prescribed burn, you can just destroy insects and pathogens, which we have said many times in this portion of the presentation. It's also possible to use a prescribed burn to prepare for um, a new seeding in the spring. Um, you can use it to stimulate growth, probably more in the fall, I guess, and also to create a fire break. And um, basically, you start one fire ahead of another, and the two burn together and put each other out. And they do that all the time when they're uh, doing prescribed burns to try to control what's happening. Um, recapping fires in agroecosystems. Um, fires are a pretty viable method uh, of use of sustainable farming practice. So it's something that we can look into maybe more in the logging farming than maybe the corn or soybeans farming, but time will tell. You gotta keep an open mind. Uh, before using fire though, you want to make sure that it will be a sustainable result and not some other issue. In other words, unsustainable. Um, the use of the fire might be difficult to use for most farmers um, because they have never done it and it's a huge switch. And much more research is going to be needed uh, if we're going to be able to use uh, fire on in farming areas. It's not something that's just, uh, it's something that we're just beginning to look at. Uh, and that is the end.